I don't know how many of you over the last couple of years have been watching any of the TV miniseries called The Chosen, which began uh, maybe a couple, two and a half, three years ago. How many of you have seen at least one episode? Raise your hand. Okay, well, that's about half of us. Those of you who haven't, you really should. It's very intriguing. It's, uh, uh, you know, people ask me all the time how accurate it is to Scripture. Not very much. It's, uh, it's, some of it is speculation in terms of how the disciples were chosen, but it's good speculation. It's interesting. And you know how they say a picture is worth a thousand words? Well, in this particular series, I'd say a picture is worth a hundred thousand words. It really is impactful. It is moving. It is riveting TV. Uh, same thing that you might see done at a high, it's highly produced that you might see in a major uh, theater. So anyway, uh, what's, what uh, the thought struck me while I was watching a few episodes, and we're ready for season three, the thought struck me is that not all of the disciples were, were uh, depicted. In fact, I think one of them will not be depicted, would be my guess. Uh, at the point where I'm in the show, about six or seven of the disciples have been identified, but... Uh, there was one that is sort of the forgotten disciple, sort of the forgotten disciple. And yet, let me tell you, in some ways, I think he may be the most admirable. You say, what? One's forgotten. Some of you won't even know his name. And yet, he might be the most admirable. Have you lost your mind? Well, that's a separate issue. But nevertheless... We start reading in Acts chapter 1, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus died, was crucified, resurrected, and Judas, you remember, who had betrayed Jesus and also stolen money from the treasurer and had generally been a bad guy all the way through the ministry of Jesus, was finally found out after the betrayal. And he has committed suicide. So the 12 have become 11. And yet the church is about to begin, and so Jesus ascends into heaven during the 40 days after he suffered and died. He appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he taught them about the kingdom of God. And once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. So Jesus is in Jerusalem with the disciples, and you hear what he says, stay here, stay here until the Father sends you the gift. What gift? That's going to be his Holy Spirit that he has promised. And he said, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus then right in front of them in the verses I'm skipping, ascends into heaven. And he leaves the disciples there in Jerusalem, just as he had told them. They return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. When they arrived, they went upstairs room of where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. All right, we know most of these names. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. There's the 11. That was 11. So they're in this room, and they all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. And during this time, there were about 120 believers together in one place. So keep that in mind. We got the 11 disciples We've got Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, and we've got about 120 others. And Peter, of course Peter, took over and stood up and addressed them and said, Brothers, the Scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. But now he is going to go on and say, it's time for us to pick a successor and bring the number back up to 12 for the disciples, the chosen. And what I find interesting here is that Peter is the one who stood up. In other words, Peter is the moderator of this meeting. I, 
I think I know how he got elected to that position. I sort of suspect that somebody said, nominations are in order for the moderator, and Peter said, I nominate Peter. And he didn't wait for any other answers. He just jumped up and started speaking. By the way, I say that with some jest, but I think Peter was the greatest of the apostles. He is always listed first in any mentioning of them. It's Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He is always listed first. He was almost always the spokesman. He's the one here on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 on the first day of the church that's going to preach the first gospel sermon. So here they are. What are they to be doing? Well, Jesus had told them, stay in the room and pray. Stay in the room and pray. And now Peter tells them we should also be praying. Ten days. Ten days. Did you ever wonder what they prayed about for ten days? Have you ever tried to pray for ten days? If some of us had to pray for ten minutes, we would completely run out of things to say. Did you ever try to pray for an hour? Did you ever promise, I am going in a quiet time with God, I am going to pray for an hour. I am absolutely going to spend an hour with God in prayer. And you started off and you prayed for all of your needs and you prayed for all of your family and you prayed for all of your friends and you prayed for the church and you prayed for the elders and you prayed for me and for Steve and for Sean and, and you prayed for the children's ministry and the youth ministry and you prayed for the missionaries in China and the missionaries everywhere else and you, pray, and you, and you think you're doing well and you think surely an hour has passed and you open your eyes and look at the clock and it's been six minutes. You ever had that experience? Seriously, it is hard to pray for an hour. Can you imagine praying for 10 days? I wonder what they prayed. They don't know for sure what's about to happen. They know that the Holy Spirit is about to come on them, but they don't know what that means for sure. They don't know what's about to happen. What did they pray? I could guess. Oh, I could guess. I imagine Peter prayed part of that time. I feel just terrible, Lord Please forgive me. While you, Lord, were there being crucified, I was out cursing and swearing and denying that I even knew who you were. Lord, forgive me for that. I think Peter could have spent at least two or three days praying for just that alone, don't you? I think James and John might have been praying there and saying, Lord, please forgive us. Our, our mother came and asked for us to have a special seat in your kingdom. And that is embarrassing. And that was so presumptuous of her. And it was so wrong of our entire families. And looking back on that now, we see that that's such a terrible thing to do, wanting the best place by your side in the kingdom. How awful that was, Lord. Please forgive me of that. I can certainly see Thomas praying for a good part of about 10 days, can't you? Lord, I was told by every single one of my friends, the other apostles here, that, that you were raised from the dead, and I didn't believe them. I didn't believe you, and I didn't believe them. And I said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand and his feet myself, I will not believe Lord, forgive me for my lack of faith. Lord, I got it wrong. I know I got it wrong. I'm so sorry. I'm so sad that I'm going to wear Doubting Thomas for the next 2,000 years as my name. For 10 days, 10 days, they're praying in the upper room. They have a vacancy. Someone is missing. And Peter stands up and says, now you know that one of our own has betrayed the Lord and he's turned his back on the Lord and he's committed suicide. Now we have a vacancy and I'd like you to know who I think we ought to have fill that vacancy. We must choose a replacement for Judas. 
from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. Now, that is a critical, critical point for you to see. In other words, the, who is going to replace Judas and be one of the apostles for the future had to be with them from the beginning, the very beginning, three years of ministry. From the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Well, see, John was at the beginning of the Lord's ministry. This person had been baptized by John, and that's how we know he was with them all the time too. Because John quickly faded from the scene. Whoever has chosen us will be a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So there's a third qualification. He had to actually be there and see Jesus as resurrected. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. Whoa, I didn't do that. I didn't. I just touched it one time. Wow. All right. Try to get me back while I'll just describe what happened. All right, so Peter says to them, you know the qualifications. In the first place, whoever fills this vacancy had to be one who were baptized under John's ministry. And he had to have followed Jesus from the very beginning for these three years. And he has to be a witness of the resurrection of Christ. Who do you nominate? And somebody, we don't know who, I'd like to think it was actually Matthias, said, I nominate Justice. Let's see, I think his name was called Barsabbas. And somebody else said, I nominate Matthias. Each of these fellows qualified to be one of the twelve. Each was converted under John. Each was baptized by John. Each has followed for three years the ministry of Christ and traveled with his disciples. Each has witnessed his resurrection. Each of these men qualify. And Peter said, all right, now let's pray about these mat this matter. And he says, Lord, show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other eleven. Wow. The lot fell to Matthias. I got to say something about that, and this is important. We have never heard of Matthias before this verse. First time his name's ever mentioned. We've never heard of him. We know he was with Jesus, traveling with him. We know he was a part of the 120, but we've never heard his name mentioned. Gets better. We never hear Matthias' name again after this verse. Nothing is said about him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yet he was baptized by John the Baptist. Nothing is said about Matthias from Acts chapter 2 to Revelation 22. Not one word was said before about Matthias. Not one word was said after about Matthias. And so you say, well, then how in the world could you possibly say you think he's one of the most admirable of the twelve? That's exactly why. He had served the Lord quietly through all of that time. No fanfare. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John didn't write a word about him. Never used his name wasn't chosen as one of the original 12 by Jesus. We don't see his name anywhere else, but we see his footprints. In the sands of history, as we read the book of Acts, we see the footprints of Messiah through Matthias. Now, Matthias was converted through the preaching of John. We know that from what Acts 121 says. How do we know he was baptized by John? Because he had to be to be numbered by the twelve. So why was he so admirable? What is it about Matthias that causes me to rise with admiration? 
Here's it. He had to be unbelievably disappointed when the other disciples were chosen. We know he qualified. We know he had decided as a part of the 120, the 70 disciples, first of all, and then the 120 on the day of, Pente uh, on the day of Pentecost. We know that he had decided more than three years ago to follow Jesus, give up everything and follow Jesus. But as the Lord gathered that great crowd on a mountainside and said, I've prayed all night and said, I want to tell you the ones that are chosen, at daybreak he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. And you know Matthias was standing there along with everybody else. That's one of the qualifications. He's been traveling with Jesus all along. Matthias is standing there too. You know he's already made the decision and the commitment to give his whole life to God. He wants to be one of the 12. Jesus starts and says, Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Simon, Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot. Matthew was hoping he would be chosen. Matthias thought he would be chosen. He had already packed his bags and was ready to go. I wanted to be numbered among them and follow him day and night. I wanted to watch all of his miracles. I wanted to hear all of his teaching. I wanted to camp out with my buddies. I wanted to walk with him, sleep with him, live with him every day of my life. I wanted to give my all and leave all and follow him. One, two, three. All the way up to 12 names Jesus gave. Not Matthias's. He was not the chosen. Now, if that had been you or me in Matthias's shoes, how do you think we would have felt? What do you think we would have said? Well, they just don't appreciate me around there. I've been here as long as any of the rest of them. Nobody ever calls my name out anymore. They never recognize me. I'm going where I'm appreciated. Funny thing, that kind of person never finds that place, you know. Matthias had no complaints. Matthias offered no excuses. He was not sour. He kept following. He kept following through all the three years and he's there with the 120 in the upper room on the day before Pentecost he had prepared himself thoroughly and he was not the chosen the Bible seems to say he had been with Christ longer than some of the others he had served longer than some of the twelve but he wasn't chosen. Still, Matthias had no sour grapes. He had no complaints. He just kept serving God and kept on and kept on and kept on. Think about what all he missed when he wasn't chosen. Oh my. He didn't go inside the room with Peter and James and John when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. That's a beautiful scene in the TV show, The Chosen. He didn't go up on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter and James and John went and suddenly a great light shined and here's Moses and Elijah. Huh? Matthias missed that. He didn't get to go up on top of the mountain with Jesus to pray. He wasn't there in the storm out on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus said, peace be still and a whole storm stopped. He didn't get to see Lazarus raised from the dead. He didn't get to be in the inner circle 
but he just kept on serving. He said, I wasn't chosen, but you can count on me. I didn't get it, but you can count on me. I don't understand. I mean, Peter, I've known Peter since he was a kid. <laughs> a loud mouth guy, you know, impetuous and tempestuous, both. I mean, when, when Jesus was being arrested, he was out cursing and swearing and denying, and that's been him all his life. No, Matthias didn't say that. Matthias didn't say, Matthew, a tax collector? A tax collector and a traitor to the Jews got in ahead of me? No, I didn't say that. He didn't say, Simon the Zealot, well, he's more interested in overthrowing the government and politics than he is in Jesus. No, didn't say that. He just said, I wanted to be one of the 12. I wanted to be, but if I can't be one of the 12, I'll be one of the 120. I was thinking the other night when I was thinking about this message, about all the people in our church through the years, and, and I was praying actually and thanking God for so many of you. You know who I thought about? I thought about the Matthiases who just keep going and going and going. Where's your name in the Bible, Matthias? Well, I didn't get my name in the Bible except right here for one verse. But I got to serve God all those years. Matthias, let's see. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, James, Judas. Where's your name? I, I, I didn't get it. I was very disappointed. I thought for sure I would be. I wanted to be a disciple. But at least I can serve Christ. Well, aren't you going to quit? They don't appreciate you there like they should. No, they don't have to appreciate me. I appreciate Jesus too much. It's not a matter of the people appreciating me. It's me appreciating Jesus for what he has done for me, and that's why I serve. And so I'm just going to keep on. That's what the Apostle Paul meant when he told Timothy, preach the Word of God, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not, whether you are chosen or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Just keep on going. God bless Matthias. Now, I admire Andrew. He was one of the chosen ones. He brought others to Jesus. I admire Peter. He was one of the chosen ones. He would step out in faith when nobody else would. I admire John. He was the disciple close to Jesus' heart. But I admire Matthias maybe the most because he got no attention whatsoever and he was still faithful. Let me try to bring that home a little bit, all right? Pull up a little closer to me and let me try to bring this home for just a minute. People all the time tell me what a great church this is. I hear it every week. Sometimes I hear it personally. I hear it a lot on streaming, online, or I hear it through emails or texts or other things. People all the time tell me what a great church this is, what a special church this is. And I think it is. It's my favorite church in the world. But do you know what has made this church what it is? The Matthiases. The people who just stick with the job. The people who keep the nursery. The people who set up tables week after week and take them back down. The people who prepare the Wednesday night meals. The people who visit the hospitals. The people who visit the funeral homes. The people that teach small children. The people that teach teenagers and take teenagers on trips. The people that take a purple encouragement card every now and then on the pew in front of you and send it to somebody else to encourage them. The people that give baby showers. The people that give wedding showers. The people that clean up the kitchen. The people that serve in the... Uh, in fact, they're... They, Today we're advertising the ministry. They didn't know I was going to do this. I didn't know they were going to do this. But to advertise the moving ministry, those of you who wore your, your moving ministry shirts today, please stand for just a moment. The people who help other people move have, have done a physical work that has brought people to church. What a great thing. And
And the people who ride the go-karts back and forth across the campus to give people rides and give them water and then invite them to church. And the people who are going this Thursday over to Podorf as one of four or five different outreach projects we have every year in Love Your Neighbor with Podorf Elementary School. The people who are going over there to read, I'm going I'm to be there at 1130 uh, reading uh, Dr. Seuss to second graders this Thursday morning, and I can't wait. I mean, the people who give the Christmas project to those children and all the other things we do there. I mean, the people who invite friends to church, the people who host small groups in their homes. I could go on and on and on and on and on by saying, yes, this is a great church, and it's a great church because there are a whole lot of great Matthiases in here. That's what makes it that way. It is. People don't get a lot of fanfare. They don't stand up here and run their mouth like I do. They don't stand up here and sing and say we're all being remanded rather than remaining. You do know what remand means, don't you? That means you're being arrested. For the Lord. Lord. Arrested for the Lord. Okay. (laughs) They're not the people that stand up here and do that. They're the people who do all the other things. The Matthiases. That's what makes a difference. That's why the Bible says, let's not get tired of doing what is good, for at just the right time we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So whenever we have opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of God. Suppose Jesus said, you know, I came for my own people and they rejected me, so I think I'll just quit. I'm just so tired. They beat me half to death. They humiliated me. They crucified me. I've been causing the sun to rise every morning for thousands of years. I'm just tired of it. I think I'll take a few days off. Sun's not rising tomorrow morning. I'm just tired of feeding people. No, the Lord has never done that and promised he won't. Matthias said, okay, okay, I wanted to be chosen, I wasn't. So, I'll keep serving anyway. And so, as I said, I've spent a little time this week thinking about so many of you. Thankful for and praying for so many of you, how you stayed with it. And never quit. When the history of any church is written, including the history of the Gulf Coast Church is written, it won't be written by those I call Alka-Seltzers. You put them in the water and they fizzle for a little while and then you don't see them anymore. It will be written in the blood of men and women who said, I am going to stay busy for God. I am going to stay on the firing line for God. I am going to stay committed to God and his church like Matthias I'm going to stay to the very end, whether anybody names me or anybody recognizes me or not, whether I get disappointed or I don't. So what happened? Jesus is gone. Peter gathers 120 together and says, now folks, Judas has committed suicide. And he says, let's select somebody else. Somebody said, I nominate Matthias. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? See the reaction on his face? And Matthias says, well, I declare, I'm not really worthy. I've just been serving all these years. Somebody else says, well, I nominate justice. I think maybe it was Matthias in that moment who nominated justice. Maybe he even said, folks, Vote for justice. He's more worthy and deserving than I am. And they went outside and they cast, prayed and they cast lots. And he came back in and Peter said, Matthias, you're it. You're one of the 12. And I can just see tears streaming down Matthias's face as he said, three years ago, I gave that up. Three years ago, I said it would never be for me. 
And now I'm one of the 12. God has a wonderful way of rewarding those who stick it out. Stick it out. Stick it out. And so, to me, the most interesting of the chosen was the unchosen. (laughs) To me, the most interesting and admirable of the chosen was the forgotten one. I'm going to be very curious to see as this series comes to a conclusion if they even mention or bring Matthias in to the story. The point for all of us is this. God has a place for you. Wherever that place is, serve in it. Whether you get any recognition, whether your name is ever mentioned, because ultimately, you're serving God and what He has done for you. And that's always in the forefront of a real servant like Matthias's mind. The chosen's forgotten one, to me, the most admirable of all the apostles.